Uh, AWS takes great pleasure in presenting Dr. Han Su Yan to speak to you th this noon. Uh, Dr. Han is a renowned physician from Asia and also an author. She is a lecturer at the University of Singapore on contemporary Asian literature and sometimes speaks to 5,000 students at a time. And she will be speaking today on the many faces of Asia, which she has um, proven an authority because after her tour here in America, she will return to her home in, in Southeast Asia and plans on writing some articles about America and is presently writing five volumes on the history of, of China. And her first volume will be published next fall. So, Dr. Han. There is a slight correction to make. I'm not writing a history of China. I'm writing the story of a Chinese family through the last 100 years of war, revolution, and change in China. The uh, first volume will be published in America this fall. Today we are going to talk about Asia, which is nothing new to you perhaps, but perhaps the way I'm going to put it is slightly different. The reason for this being that as a doctor in Asia for the last 15 years and traveling in most of the countries of Asia, including China, where I go every year for a visit for the past eight years, it has seemed to me that there are certain premises, certain aspects of the time we are going through, which may be useful to you in order to comprehend what is going on. Many, many experts in your country in America are spending much time, money, and ability in studying what they call the problems of the world. It seems to me that sometimes their marvelous ability, their great devotion to research and techniques are biased because the premises upon which they stand may sometimes not be fully comprehended emotionally. It takes more than brain to understand the human being. It also takes a heart and an emotion. And I'm not speaking sentimentally. I am speaking of the full human being who, after all, lives not by brain alone, but also by the emotion he en en engenders, by the emotions and the aspirations which also fashion history. And we are all living in history. We are all living in a time of change. And the first thing we must understand is this change. Today's Africa is not yesterday's Africa. Today's Asia is not yesterday's Asia. And to try to put the clock back, to turn back the wheels, is impossible, dangerous for all of us. And so among the many faces of Asia that we see, one that we may not be aware of, is the face of what is called in Asia the Long Revolution. The Long Revolution of Asia began a very long time ago. It began actually when the West met the East in a way which was not altogether happy. And one of the first things we must become aware of, perhaps, is the fact that although we all live at the same point of time, for we are all at the same point of time, today being March 24, 1965, yet we are not the same at the same point of time. And this is a thing which often escapes us when we assume that other people, because they live at the same time by the clock that we do, are at the same time in their brain or their hearts, their emotions, their history. This is not true. And one of the basic things about Asia that we must understand, we Asians, 
as well as you, and perhaps you have not fully realized it, but this is the basic concept upon which we must start, is the fact that we are at a different point of time, for we have not had yet the industrial revolution until this present era, whereas you had your industrial revolution, your technical age and renaissance 400 years ago. Now, this is a simple thing, and it may appear at first an innocuous statement, perhaps even a trite one, and yet it is a most important thing. For we often forget that our minds are conditioned by the technical structures that surround us to a far greater extent than we think. In feudal Europe, before the 15th century, people thought in certain ways. They had certain patterns of behavior, which the introduction of the Industrial Revolution, the discovery, starting with the discovery of the steam engine, such a simple thing, altered very much. It introduced the Western world, of which you are the heirs, to the technological culture which you enjoy today, and which today is opening up yet another chapter in the history of mankind, the space age. And God only knows what and how our emotions will be, our feelings, when they are conditioned by the technology of the space age. Already we see them changing before us. We see every value questioned. We see everything changing. We are aware of it. And sometimes we talk of this as a confusion of morals or an issue of values. But really what we are undergoing is, is the change imposed upon us by our changing technologies. But in Asia, this only occurred recently because, very simply, we in Asia did not discover the steam engine. <laughs> Therefore, the Industrial Revolution did not come to us naturally. It was not a product of our own growth. It came to us with the West. And it came to us in a very unhappy way, which you, among you, those who know history, should read. And it is the same for Africa. Africa, to Africa, the impact of the West was a dreadful tragedy, a tragedy from which Africa, even today, has not yet recovered. Now, this basic premise, this beginning, is very often forgotten by your newspaper men, by your experts, when they write about Asia. They assume that it would take only a few peace corpsmen, or some foreign aid, or a few industries here and there, in order for us to become like you. We can never become like you. And one of the things you must understand about Asia, therefore, is that at the moment, we are in this process of making our great technological industri industrial revolution in our own way, that it will be in our own way, that it will be a long revolutionary process similar to the one that struck Europe when Europe became not only an industrially, an industrial country, but also full of its own nationalisms, its own identities, and that we cannot therefore say what the future will be. Nor can we tell at this moment what kind of structures, what kind of organizations this long revolution in all the countries of Asia will evolve. In other words, we come to fallacy number two assumed by the West. The fallacy that Western type democracy is the only way for everybody to run their own country. And yet you must remember that this cannot be because your own types of democracy, types of representative parliaments and so on, were only evolved slowly and painfully and through centuries of tyranny.
and they only came to fruition recently and in many cases in Europe itself these institutions of which you may justly be proud are constantly threatened by facts of history which are not within the ideal evolved by your best, most liberal, and most humane representatives throughout the last decades. In the same way in Asia, through this long revolution which started 200, 100 years ago and which is continuing today, we have to evolve our own forms, our own shapes, our own institutions, and they may be entirely different from yours. They may assume names that you do not like and shapes that you do not agree with, but they are part of this great process of change through which we are going and which is not in step with yours because, as I said before, you have 200 years advance on us. And now, let me, to be a little bit more succinct, more to the point, put to you one of the faces of Asia that people always forget. It is often forgotten that in many of the countries of Asia, 80% of the people are still tilling the soil. In America, you have 8% of your people producing your food, producing enough and a surplus for your population. And that is because your agriculture is mechanized so that you need only very few people, a small percentage, a fraction of your population to produce enough for the rest who are employed in industries, in factories, and in other ways. But in Asia, in many countries, it is not so. The greater bulk of the population, up to 85%, 80 to 85%, are on the land tilling the soil. And the way they till the soil is pre-industrial revolution. It is pre-technological. They use tools, hoes and plows, which date back a thousand years. And it is not the introduction of a few pilot farms, the introduction of a few tractors here and there, which makes wonderful photography and propaganda for whatever nation gave them, that is going to change those 80% quickly. It is not going to do very much if it is left at the stage of just experimentation. We have 80% of our population still with primitive methods of agriculture tilling a land that is tired, a soil that has been used for many, many centuries and which needs replenishment. And in among these 80%, in many countries, the land tenure, the way the land is held, is inefficient and feudal. We still have, in India today, places where big landowners own many, many, many thousands of acres, but the small farmer, the small tiller on the soil, is incapable of improving himself and lives at a subhuman level, at a stagnation level, in which he can never rise above poverty. He is in debt, not only through his life, but through the lives of his sons and his grandsons. The land he tills is very small. He pays land rent, which is very high, sometimes up to 50% of his crop. On top of that, he has the usurer because he goes from harvest to harvest, waiting for the harvest for money, because it is only when he has got his crop that he can sell it. But meanwhile, anything may occur, an accident, some illness, which makes him borrow money from the money lender and the moneylender charges a very high price in Malaya today. Even in Malaya, which is supposed to be so rich, the peasant is still in dire poverty. And the 
money lender still demands something in interest, something approaching 10% a month, and in interest only. So that you get this population of peasants, 80% in many countries of Asia, tied to poverty and tied to feudalism, tied to a primitive land tenure, tied to primitive instruments, to a soil that is poor and which he is incapable of improving because he does not have the capital to get fertilizers, to get good seeds, and to do something about it. So that all over Asia and Africa, whenever independence comes, the first cry is land reform. And it has been to me a source of surprise and astonishment that two simple words like land reform, when used in America in my lectures, should have evoked so much indignation in many cases, as if it was something evil to do land reform. But we all know, we in Asia all know, that without land reform, without doing something about the tenure of land, the feudal structures which still strangle and imprison the majority of the peasant population, there can be no relief to poverty. There can be no way out of this morass of misery and stagnation, illiteracy and ignorance, which holds the greater bulk, the majority of the population in debt. And this is true for Africa as well as it is true for Asia. Therefore, many of our governments, many of the governments in Asia, the moment they come to independence, and here I must remind you that independence for us is new, not old. Many of them immediately start talking and thinking in terms of land reform. But talking and thinking of something is one, and doing something about it is quite another matter. And here we have the great, the agonizing problem. What ways and what means, what structures, how shall we accomplish the drastic down-to-earth reforms that are necessary in order to lift our peoples up from poverty and into the industrial age. In other words, to make the country a modern industrial state. And here we come to the great divide, to the great misunderstanding that occurs. For it seems to us in Asia that very often when land reform and other reforms are taken which drastically alter the pattern imposed by the past. Then misunderstanding crops in and the Western powers become alarmed and inevitably look upon these changes as evil, even though these changes may be good for our own people. And this misunderstanding, it seems to me, is based upon the fact that there is an assumption made that only the way that the West has taken, which was 200 years back, would be the only right way for us, and this is not true. We are not like you. We have much more poverty, greater multitudes to cater for. We cannot afford the kind of institutions that you have. We cannot afford the life that you have. We do not have the budgets that you have. We do not have the money. We do not have the resources. We have to do it our own way and with as little interference as possible. And one of the main things that faces, one of the main problems that faces us in Asia, the first one of all, is land reform for the 80%. And until and unless we do land reform, we are nowhere. And it is precisely upon this land reform, when it is undertaken, that contradictions come in. For very often, when these reforms have to be made, we find that we are in a state of social unrest. In other words, in our own countries, we have elements, we have people who profit from the misery of others. And this also in history is very evident and very natural. There have always been people 
like the feudal barons of old, who derived their wealth and their power from the oppression of their own peasants. This also happens in Asia, but it happens today, not 500 years ago. And many times what happens also is that in our governments, in people who, are, who represent us and who have taken the first steps towards independence, there are also these people whose interests basically lie in maintaining certain aspects of the old order. And yet history goes forward and cannot go back. And what happens then is that these, there is contradiction and there is unrest. And there is an ever sharpening struggle between these people and the rest of the population whose aspirations are strong for a better life. And again there, there comes misunderstanding. For a few decades ago, even a hundred years ago, communications were not as they are today. Today, we are all in each other's backyard. We all watch each other perhaps too much. We all interfere perhaps too much with each other. And we all assume, and especially in the West, that anything that happens, whether it is in India or in Africa, concerns us. And yet, this allergic preoccupation with the long revolution should be a good thing if it is guided by the motive of really helping the peoples of the world to achieve security. Unfortunately, we in Asia do not feel that this is always the case. We know our problems, and we know that our problems require drastic changes. But very often we find, alas, that when drastic change is required, it is opposed not only by those people's intent on preserving the old order, but that they are backed by foreign elements and powers who do not seem to understand that by doing so, they are only trying to push back the evolution of history. As I said before, independence to Asia only came recently. It may refresh your memories to remember that independence to India only came in 1947, which is only 20 years ago, and that many people in India still remember the old days of colonialism. In Indonesia, too, it only came after the Second World War, and so it did in Indochina. And for most of us in Asia, the way in which this independence came was also bloody, violent, and tragic. For in spite of the fact that in 1945, the United Nations Charter promised independence and freedom of choice of the government they wanted to many other countries in Asia, unfortunately, this promise was not borne out after the Second World War. For as soon as it was finished, the British returned to Malaya, the French returned to Indochina, and the Dutch returned to Indonesia, their old colonies, and tried once again to put up a struggle there in order to remain in power. And it was only after nearly nine years of fighting that at Diem Bien Phu, the French power and 350,000 French soldiers crumbled before the fighting of the troops of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh. It was only in 1951, after three years of bloody and sanguinary struggle, that Indonesia finally achieved her independence under President Sukarno. And it was only in 1957 that Malaya acquired her independence. So that for these countries, what happened is very new near. The fact that violence had to be used was very real. And the fact that promises were not kept is also something which is constantly in mind. In order to be able, therefore, to understand the problems of today, we must go back to yesterday and remember some of these facts. Remember them as premises of what happened and what, therefore, colors 
our minds and our emotions. And now today we have in front of us this Asia struggling through her long revolution. Struggling and this struggle will continue for at least 100 years. Not only in Asia but also in Africa. We are only at the beginning of our own modern technological age. We have at least in front of us, it is reckoned, a hundred years to go before we attain your present state. We have a great many problems. The most important one, the basic one, being the 80% of our people who live on stagnation level on the land, producing scarcely enough food. 80% of them leaves only 20% available for industrial development. We have enormous problems of poverty, and they are very difficult for us to solve. Colonialism in many countries is reckoned to have done much good, but I don't think that any Asian will be of the same mind. Because, to give you only an example, after 300 years of Dutch colonialism in Indonesia, there were only 600 doctors in Indonesia in 1951 for 70 million people. There are now 2,000. And I don't think that many people in Africa are very grateful to colonialism because in the Belgian Congo, after 70 years of Belgian paternal benevolence, there were only four university, four or seven university graduates, and that is not very much. And I think that many people in Africa, in the Congo, still remember the old days under Belgian benevolent paternalism, when if they did not bring in their ivory that they were taxed for, they had their hands cut off. So that all this is still present to us. It is not in the past. And our revolution is today and not yesterday. And it is imperative that the West should understand this, should understand it in the light of history, and should understand that this is an irreversible process which cannot be stopped. We have our problems, and they are enormous. Not only the poverty, not only the land reform that is to be done, not only our industrialization, but above and on top of all that, perhaps, we have the fact that we are living in an age which is no longer an age in which there can be expansion for us, as there was for you. When 200 years ago Europe started her industrial revolution, she had the whole world to exploit. At that time, England could send her fleet and conquer by trade the great markets of the East. There was room, there was elbow room and more. At that time in Africa there was the slave trade and many, many industries, many of your, much of your wealth, cotton wealth at that time came from the employment of cheap labor as slaves. This can no longer be done. The countries of Asia have a very little capital and they have no ways of exploiting in order to get capital from elsewhere as you had. The, your wealth today comes from the accumulation of 200 years of the past, which is not right for Asia. You in America were especially fortunate in that you had a whole continent, the continent of America, open and free, with its vast resources to exploit. And you were a small population, but with an advanced technological level for the time already, so that it was possible for you very rapidly to turn the great American continent into a wonderful and a wealthy place. And so all these things happened to you, and good luck, and we are very happy that you are and have been so fortunate. But it is not ours. We do not have this luck. We do not have these resources. And therefore, we cannot have your present. And the future for us is also going to be hard. Therefore, the least that we can ask for 
from you is understanding and non-interference and possibly a help in the right directions not to bolster up the corrupt inefficient past but to help us with our future our future will take a long time to evolve it will take a hundred years some of our Asian friends some of my Asian friends also delude themselves because we have cities in which there are industries and we have airports where there are jet planes they feel they have already reached the industrial age but this is not true because in the countryside 80 percent of our own people still live in a primitive way and until they have electricity and education and all the things that you find in the cities are 80 percent which condition our countries to poverty and maintain them in poverty will be poor and will keep us poor for some decades to come when in Asia we talk of industries in the cities we are also deluding ourselves in another manner it is true that there is some industries in Asia today in most of the countries of Asia some attempt at industrialization have been made some factories have been erected there are some steel mills but this only produces 14 percent of our export whereas agricultural products extractive products prime raw materials are 86 percent and when we have these industries we come across another difficulty which is where are we going to sell them and there we come against another vicious spiral which is what is now called in Asia the problem of trade supposing that some country of Asia produces motor cars or starts to produce motor cars and wants to sell them on the world market well it is very difficult for them because the world market is already occupied where motor cars are concerned by other more sophisticated better developed industries uh, motor car industries from the west and from America therefore competition is very difficult for them and yet unless they sell what is the good of having an industry when you cannot when um, sell your product in order to be able to acquire foreign exchange this foreign exchange enabling you in turn to acquire some more capital equipment in order to raise your own level slowly and yet this kind of step is very difficult it is practically impossible and it has led to a great deal of resentment from many countries in the world the result being that last year in Geneva there was a United Nations conference on trade and aid and development in which 77 of the countries that are only just reaching their industrial revolution began to complain to the others those who were already well established in order to say look if we do not find a market for our exports if all the time we are maintained at this level of finding it so difficult to acquire capital equipment that we need then we cannot advance and if we cannot advance we go back because our populations grow our problems grow our poverty grows but our trade does not expand we do not expand our income and therefore we are falling back rather than going forward and this is another thing which is often lost sight of is that in this today in this era of today the undeveloped countries the countries of Asia that are seeking to do the breakthrough into an industrial revolution are further incapacitated to a point that was not yours when you did your breakthrough a, a century ago and so you see these are some of the basic problems of Asia the problem of land reform the problem of industrialization the problem of growth of income 
These are the fundamental problems and the social economic picture which is leading us, which is inevitably leading us to a century of social change and transformation. And for any country today to say to us that they are seeking stability in the statu quo is nonsense. The statu quo is temporary. All our institutions and governments are to be regarded as temporary, on the way to something else, just as it was in Europe when Europe made her breakthrough from feudalism to the industrial age. And this fundamental fact, so simple and yet so complicated, so diverse in all its manifestations, and yet stemming from one reason only, this has to be understood. I hope that it will be understood by your generation of young Americans, that you will understand that good intentions are not enough. There must also be knowledge. That to think that foreign aid, which is really only a palliative, or the Peace Corps, which is only another palliative, is going to solve the problems of Asia or Africa, is to delude yourself and to think that this fundamental revolutionary change of Asia, which will be going on for some decades to come, can be stopped in any way by backing the reactionary, dishonest, and inefficient elements in the governments of today, is also to delude yourselves. These are the faces of Asia which are important, the true ones, not the ones that are usually talked of in your newspapers. Many of your newspaper correspondents concentrate more upon the political side. But politics are only a reflection of the other, the more fundamental, the concrete and basic social economic tensions which arise. They take many forms. At one time they were called democracy. Democracy at one time was a name which was abhorred. It was considered to be a democrat was just the same as to be considered today a communist. It was a dreadful thing. Names are one thing, facts are another. And we cannot let ourselves and our thinking be conditioned by semantics. We cannot shy away because a country proclaims land reform and say that per se this land reform is wrong, and yet this happens all the time. We must look upon the basic facts and we must remember that one of the things which in South Vietnam led to the present situation was the fact that land reform there was not done. It was attempted, but it was not done. And we must also remember that if tomorrow India has a revolution and a revolution will come to India, it is because land reform has not been done. We cannot afford to delude ourselves any longer. And this is why, my friends, I came to you today to speak a little bit about the true face of Asia, which is the face of poverty, the face of hunger, because of this basic land problem, which has not been tackled in many of, its, of the countries. I usually have about one hour to talk in, but today I was advised that many of you have to go at 10 to 12. Therefore, I have had to cut my speech short and to put everything into 40 minutes. But thank you for listening to me and to these 40 minutes of mine. I am sure that I am most grateful to you for coming and for listening to me. And I hope that in the few weeks to come, you will probably you will possibly think or read a little further about Asia and especially about our land problems, about our trade problems, about the whole paraphernalia of problems. For if there's one thing we are rich of, it is in problems, <laughs> which is holding us into a state of change and which we will continue as I said before, for at least 100 years. And as you had your revolution in 1776, so all of us in Asia are looking forward, or must look forward, whether we like it or not, 
whether we like it or not, and some of us do not like it, for we have much to lose to a revolution or a change at least as drastic as yours in 1776. We are looking forward to this in this century. And all I can say to you is that if I have been able to impress upon you the importance of trying to understand concrete facts rather than relying upon myths, semantics, and political slogans which have absolutely no validity in the present situation, then perhaps our very brief meeting today has been conducive, has been useful in one way or another. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
or even looking forward to a job in the State Department or the Peace Corps, uh, I should imagine that it would be an excellent introduction. Where do you come from? from Cuba. Oh, you come from Cuba, so yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, well, uh, uh, this gentleman uh, comes from Cuba and he has two questions, not one. Excuse me, sit down. Two <laughs> questions, not one. The first question being, he thinks I'm preaching isolationism, he says, because I say, uh, because I'm dealing with Asia and in a way this gentleman has the feeling that I'm preaching isolationism. Well. The first question, I'm not preaching isolationism. I am preaching non-support of the backward, inefficient, corrupt, and dishonest elements which are holding back the necessary changes in our countries. That is quite different from preaching isolationism. In other words, I am saying that it is time the West should realize that the good old days of backing strong men who were strong only in keeping their own people down should be done with. A lesson should be learned from history. And that perhaps we should open our eyes wide and see that that kind of thing is only conducive to more trouble and more misunderstanding. This is not isolationism. This is non-interference with backing the wrong kind of feudal or other elements which are standing in the way of a thorough and drastic restructuring which I'm afraid is inevitable in our country. Then your second question was, I'm f f well, I that Ah, yes, there's one about export. Well, that just goes to show that, uh, in a way, uh, our problems, you see, uh, must be different. Let me give you some figures of the total income per head, per day, or per year in, say, India. In India, it has been calculated and reported in the lower house of parliament that the average income per head in India is six cents a day. How, how do you buy a car on that kind of income? In other words, the problem of our poverty, of the 80% on the land who are stagnating in poverty, is precisely this one, that they have not entered the moneyed economy. They have not entered the moneyed economy because they are in debt, they are at a subhuman level, the income, in other words, is not even enough to be able to afford buying the products of their own industries. Do I make my, my meaning clear? Therefore, the main problem in land reform is to raise the peasant to such a level of prosperity that he can at last enter the moneyed economy. In other words, it is the accumulation of capital in the countryside. Now, the accumulation of capital in the countryside through one means or another in order to bring up the level of the peasant and make him a consumer of goods, of your own goods that you produce, is basically, is to be based on land reform. Do I make my meaning clear? Well. No, too many. I'm sorry. I'll have to choose. I think you started first. Well, where are uh, four eight million dollars? Not making the level of the people. Uh, this lady wonders where the foreign aid money is going to if it is, does not reach the uh, level of aiding the people of Asia. Uh, this, madam, is a question which has been asked of me by many, many Americans and I feel that the American people, and I must say it here, are really very wonderful and very great and 
very intelligent when they are not misinformed about this question as well as many others. The question of foreign aid can be divided into many parts. The, p the word aid involves a lot of things including military aid as you know, uh, economic aid, grants and all that. Some of this aid is in the form of loans, others are in the form of gifts and others again is in the form of military equipment which to my mind is the most useless of the lot. The form which is given in the form of economic aid is possibly the most useful but quite honestly it is to our minds, to the minds of many people including your own administrators, uh, the whole problem of aid, the whole problem of how it is administered, what it is given for must be rethought. I can only, because time is short, give you one or two small instances of this aid. For instance, in India, it is very well known and it has been published in India on, in a study on aid, that much of the aid in the first few years was channeled only to the private sector and not to the public sector. In other words, to private enterprises rather than to public enterprises. Uh, this, of course, produced a certain phenomenon of expanding the private enterprises and the industries in private hands, which, of course, made the half to two percent of the Indian population, which holds 80 percent of the income, richer, but did not do anything about the peasant condition, about land reform, in other words. Then there was Cambodia, where also there was aid, which produced also effects which were deleterious to the Cambodian economy, precisely for the same reason, because aid, although well-meaning and doing a few things like building roads and a few hospitals and so on, was in the main concentrated in the cities and in the hands of a few individuals, and it produced a very curious phenomenon in Cambodia, which was that all the cabinet ministers and officials began putting their money into building nice houses. These nice houses, 140 of them precisely, villas, were to house the personnel of aid, which was American. Because the personnel of aid, which was American, needed to live in a certain condition adequate with their own standard of living, which was not the Cambodian standard. As a result, the money from rent derived from these 140 houses was equivalent to 10 times the monthly salary of a cabinet minister. So that the cabinet ministers found it much more lucrative to build a house and rent it to an American than to be a cabinet minister. And this in turn led to all sorts of practices, most of them corrupt, which uh, should be examined and which uh, were uh, examined in Cambodia and which were not quite good for the Cambodian economy. Aid, I think, on the whole, has well-meant intentions. I do not think that it is and that it can be looked upon as being the answer to everything. It can be a correlative, but certainly it seems to us increasingly more and more in Asia, and this is the cry everywhere, whether it's an anti-communist or a communist country, self-reliance. We must do it by our own, in our, with our own help with our own for sources, forces. And all that we demand, and here we come back to this kind of uh, isolationism which I preach, is that understanding of this in order to be able to achieve the best results. Mm. Now on this side, just a minute, uh, I think you have tried. Which? I don't understand your what question. Ah, the question is, uh, since uh, Western aid seems to be disliked in Southeast Asia, that also uh, we will have to discuss. Um, what attempts have been made by the countries of Southeast Asia to send personnel for training to Japan or to communist China? Uh, the inference here is technical personnel, I suppose. 
uh, technical personnel sent to Japan. Now, Japan did make and has made her breakthrough into the technological age. She is the only country in Asia that has achieved this. And in fact, the history of Japan is very interesting from that point of view. We should all read it because they achieved it in the last century. And Japan is the only country that has done it. She's done it in her own way, which is fascinating and which should be read. To send technical personnel to Japan for training has of been mooted already in Southeast Asia and in several other countries. But the difficulty is the difficulty of language. The Japanese learn everything in Japanese. And in order to learn Japanese, it takes a deal of time. So that there, there have been scholarships given, for instance, in Singapore to go and train in Japan. But it is difficult because one has to learn Japanese. To send to China. China at the moment has abroad, I believe, something like 30 or 40,000 technical personnel aiding on various projects. There again, you have the difficulty that sending people to China for training, there are two difficulties. One is the political one. Immediately, these people are dubbed as communists, which is not always true. And the second one is again the language one. You have to learn Chinese. And the very fact that there are these language barriers between us in Asia establishes yet another difficulty for our aiding each other. But I believe that there will be soon a way out because in many of these countries, English is becoming the kind of lingua franca. And I know very well that in China, for instance, uh, every child now is learning either English or French or Spanish from their third year in primary school in order to be able later on to help in these languages. I do not know if the same is being done in Japan. Yes? How do uh, Asian countries combat? Well, actually, this is a very good question. How do the Asian countries combat the pe peasants' reluctance to change? I think there are several approaches to it. There is, of course, the approach that is made through persuasion, letting the peasants, educating the peasant uh, in order to get land reform. It is a slow process. And in this, you must certainly associate the peasant with all that you are doing. Now, I don't mean to say that this has not been done. It has been done in some countries, but not to the point of making any decisive showing yet except in China. In China, of course, land reform has been done. And uh, this you can read in Professor Dumont how the Chinese have done their land reform. Land reform has also been done in Formosa by the Americans. The Americans did land reform there. It cost them $10 billion. And it's a show place. All right. In India, there have been pilot land reform projects done. But it has not been carried through. It has not been on to a vast extent. And it's a question of proportion. Uh, there are some places here and there which are shown to the visitor, uh, which, have, which uh, show uh, certain improvements. But the main problem remains there. Now, we all know that in uh, South Vietnam, the problem was land reform. In, even in Malaya, there is a problem of land which is being tackled in a different way by subsidizing the peasant. The Malayan economy can stand it. In Indonesia, the land reform projects are still very much in, uh, in a melting pot and have to be attempted. But the main problem remains. It is the problem of raising the peasant into the moneyed economy. And until and unless you start on that basis, you're not going to have your agriculture in a good shape. Therefore, you're not going to have your majority population above subsistence level. And therefore, any industrialization you do and so on will be a kind of superstructure on top. In order to break this resistance, you certainly must have the peasants' cooperation. And the only way you can do it is a long-term project, even in China. It's a, a long term. It's only just now beginning to work. Yes. Over there. Where are you from? Huh? 
Indonesia. Yes. Uh, this Indonesian friend of ours asks me really what I think of President Sukarno. Is President Sukarno a communist? What is he really, etc.? Well, I think there that again we must make, we must try to understand the other person's point of view. Now, if I were an American, I would of course see things from the point of view of the best interests of America. And therefore, if I want to answer this question, truthfully and correctly, I must look at it from the point of view of an Indonesian, talking of Indonesia and talking of Sukarno as an Indonesian. In other words, the West must stop looking at everything from the point of view of what is best for them. They must also think sometimes of the way we feel, we think, and what is best for us. And from the point of view of an Indonesian, I think President Sukarno is one of the greatest figures of this century one of the greatest people of this century for three reasons. Number one, he is and still remains the person who has unified Indonesia and you know very well being Indonesian how difficult, what a tremendous task it has been to unify Indonesia with its 180 different languages and 48 different peoples and 3,000 islands. And yet he has unified Indonesia, and he has kept it unified in spite of the fact that there have been many coups against him, including a revolution, uh, a coup d'etat fomented by, unfortunately, certain agents of the West in 1958 against him in Sumatra. Among them, I believe, there were two Americans. I do not say America fomented it, there were two Americans. So from that point of view, Sukarno remains to the Indonesian a great and an outstanding feature. Number two, President Sukarno is not a communist. He is not a communist, he is a nationalist. And it is time also, I think from that point of view, that the West should realize that nationalism is the driving force in Asia today. Even communism must ally itself with nationalism to get anywhere. Therefore, everybody who accuses any nationalist in Asia who stands up and talks for his people of being a communist is playing into the hands of the communists. And that, unfortunately, is what the United States and other Western powers have done for a good long time. And the third thing about Sukarno, which is important and interesting, is this, that he is well known in Asia to be a middle-of-the-road person in relation to the West. In other words, he does not like Western interference, it is true. But he is always the first to recognize not only the usefulness of the West, but that cooperation is possible. In other words, he has said time and again, I like American people, and we all say it. We like the American people, we like the Americans, but we do not like their policies. And I think that this is a very simple thing which he has put very forthrightly. Therefore, my opinion of President Sukarno is that historically he will remain a great figure. I think he has his defects, if I may mention them. I think that he has his defects, which are the defects of many Asian politicians and statesmen of today. In other words, he is a brilliant politician, he is a great nationalist, he understands his people, he has perhaps not paid enough attention to economics until today. Yes? 
economic determinism. And there is an upsurge today, tremendous upsurge of an ethic that's coming to the forefront that you see witnessed today in Selma down here. And we are having the difficulty to overcome a tremendous tradition that's so forceful of this feudal system that's still with us, that's been taken over with other, with other forces. See, we, I for one, and many thousands and many people that I know in our division, feel identical the way you express yourself. So when you go back to Asia, we should have a feeling that it, it is not an absolute ant antithetical point of view. Here. You have many, many threats, and it's a matter of the word to me which is very important, is evolution. It is hard to change rapidly, but we're moving more rapidly than ever. So it's with a method, with a, a sort of hope that this Judean Christian ethic, which is the essence deep within us, which you most likely feel when you meet the American. So I just say with a hopeful well, thank you very much. This wasn't a question. It was an affirmation of the good in America, and I wish to say, and because it is true, that I do have felt it. I, I feel the, the greatness of the American people. I feel that you are also tormented by these questions. I feel that you want to do good. And as I said before, I feel that you are the greatest people in the world with the greatest capacity to do good if you know the score. But unfortunately, I feel just as strongly that very often you are misinformed. And that is the great pity, and I hope that more and more of you will use the Judeo-Christian ethic and will use this upsurge of goodwill in order to question the policies which are being inflicted upon us today. I'm sorry, but time limits us, and there will have to be cut from the questions. Thank you. <laughs>